Hi, and welcome to another episode of Pitch. I'm Leah St. Marie. And I'm Angel. And today we're sitting down with two very cool filmmakers, Mercedes Bryce Morgan. And Katrina M. Kudlick. So Mercedes' feature debut, Fixation, premiered at TIFF in 2022. Her second feature, Spoonful of Sugar, will be available on AMC Shutter in 2023. She is an award-winning filmmaker who has directed numerous high-profile actors Collectively, her work has over 1.5 billion views. Mercedes has directed episodic series for different studios such as MGM, Facebook Watch, Snapchat, New Form, Full Screen, and Project Greenlight. Katrina graduated from USC School of Cinematic Arts. She's produced for clients such as Freeform, Amazon, Haynes, Bumble, Mac Cosmetics, NRDC, Solo Cup, Lucasfilms, Jaunt VR, Marvel, and Pixar. After producing in every cinematic medium, she's found her niche in the indie filmmaking world. She's been a producer on six features, most recently completing Lady World, which premiered at Fantastic Fest and London BFI and had a theatrical release in August 2019. In addition to her work in the independent film world, she has also served as a resident producer at Disney+, Plus, where her focus was in marketing, enhancing Disney's digital brands across their online platforms and ideating content for their streaming service. And welcome. Uh, and I have met you both before, but you three all know each other, right? That we do. We've done some projects together. How many projects would you say you've done together? Um, two? More? More? Three? Four? <laughs> something like that. Yeah. And Mercedes directed something I wrote and Katrina mm -hmm. produced it. Do yeah. you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so it's it. called Spoonful of Sugar, and it is coming out on Shredder, and it is a psychedelic, psychological horror film um, from Leah's very twisted mind. What 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 was it like to pitch that? <laughs> I I think it was one of my favorite movies ever to pitch because we had so many invest. I remember once we had one of the best investor rejections. I've ever gotten where this man said it's really memorable but I had to go home and hug my kids afterwards and I won't be giving you any money um, oh. but uh, but it was really great because in in a way it was it was not great to not have this person's money but <laughs> but on the other hand it was great to know that the film was so effective Wow what was it like to first read the script given how twisted Oh man! It is. Um, so to go into an aside off of that, I I like things that are full of tension, and what I mean by that is I like to break down tension into three things: where you're trying to guess a mystery of the who, what, when, where, how, why of it all, and there's the threat of death and possibility of sex. And I remember that I get sent so many scripts, and Leah's script was one that I had all three of those in every damn scene of the movie. It was very, very on my edge. And I read the whole script. I think it was, I'm a fast reader, but especially as when it was 45 minutes just because I couldn't put it down. And I called up Katrina right away and I said, Katrina, this script. Yeah, and I, I remember I pushed back a meeting to finish reading it, uh, which, I, which I, I never do. <laughs> <laughs> did you had you started reading the script before mercedes told you about it katrina or did you read it on her urging so i actually i had there's a, a newsletter that both of us um were on and i remember seeing the log line on the newsletter and i remember like dog earing it thinking I'm going to read this after my meetings today. And then Mercedes <laughs> called me oh, it all happened on me one I have day. to read this. That's amazing. That's yeah. hilarious. Well, hats off to Leah for writing such a tense psycho thriller. Oh, indeed. March 2nd. March 2nd, which is in our timeline, is coming up shortly. Yeah. 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 Very and then soon. we hope to do a couple of more projects together. I know I'm, I'm about to write something that I hope will blow your socks off. I'm sure that they're already off, Leah. Great. And <laughs> they're already off. And Katrina and I have been working on my Italian project and this other thing that we're working on. And then we did, you produced a short film of mine. Yeah. Starring Angel. Oh, yeah. I was in that. You were? Me and the lovely um, Adam Sinclair. Yeah. Exactly. The lovely, talented Adam Sinclair, whose wife we were lucky enough to sit down with for another podcast. Before the fade. Before the fade. Just a little cross promotion real quick. Cross promotion. <laughs> All right. Um, what are you guys doing now? 
What creatively? Um, so I am. I have another movie shooting in May, and so I'm currently prepping that. How are you here right now? <laughs> Cause you gotta do it all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and me, I well, I have a, a movie coming out in South by, in a in a few weeks uh, called Appendage, um, which I did with Hulu and Twentieth Digital. I watched that. The the film. Yeah, I watched it. Oh yeah, you have. I You're right. Notes. It was awesome. Oh my god! For a second, I thought it was leaked. <laughs> my heart died. <laughs> you did watch it, and I you gave did. me thoughts. I I loved it actually. It was oh, right up my you. creepy little alley. That's what we're going for. <laughs> what's What's the quick pitch for Appendage? Uh, so Appendage. So it's based on the short film, which was at. Sundance and it's it's basically about a young fashion designer whose anxiety spirals to the point of manifesting in this uh, actual real life appendage that comes off of her side and grows and it, it was really great because I haven't gotten to do you know effects work like that before and so this appendage basically becomes all of her her worst thoughts and nightmares and goes oh, on a wow. whole spiral That's so twisted. it's a horror comedy so it's a little bit more fun and flavor than just gore it's really fun yeah. why do you think sundance why do you think it did well at sundance i you know i i think it just i think it just resonated maybe because everyone has anxiety <laughs> um and i think that rachel Sennett was also starring in it and she is um an undeniable talent mm -hmm. so i think that people really really connected to her and also um anna Slokovic, who's the director is just so so incredibly talented and has a real mastery over the genre that she's pulling, which is, is horror comedy, which I feel is is more rare. But every time it happens, people are really, really excited to it's, see it. It's so good because I'm reminded of all, most of Sam Raimi's early work. Yeah, right? totally. And Cabin in the Woods, mm -hmm. Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Mm -hmm. You might be the killer. And that's all I can think of for horror comedy. Oh, there's also... Um, there's another, I mean, there's like Happy Death Day more recently. Oh, and then, yeah. What is the one Megan? that, what, Megan? But there's another one, the one that I, I always bring up. She yeah, has no idea. I can't, no, she, it's the, the wedding dr dress transformation movie. Oh, Ready or Not. Ready or Not. Amazing oh, movie. Yeah, I couldn't Ready remember the not. title. I am so sorry, all of you filmmakers, but your movie's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> How did it come to be that you've seen this film? Is it because she sent it to you, Leah? Oh yeah, we trade films for notes constantly. They gave me notes for In the Light of the Moon. Oh, gotcha. Early, the, the early werewolf notes. poem love epic. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> One of the things I value most that we share. It, yeah. I feel like we all trust each other, and so we just constantly trade notes on things. I think it really is in in this industry. You try to find your people to support you, and I hope to trade notes and films with you always. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it started initially with your script originally called the sitter now spoonful mm -hmm. of sugar right that's how you, initial connection no friendship or anything before that no no but when friendship we read it yeah. when we read it we knew we wanted to be friends <laughs> <So. laughs> We're like, there's you know it's it's hard to it's hard enough to like working with the people that you work with but mm -hmm. then when you become i mean ideally you always become friends with the people that you work with and i think that we became friends with leah before we even fully started working together. Oh, that's we really just read sweet. that script and yeah. immediately, we saw Lolita, I think, right afterwards. We did. That was my yeah. first meeting with you. You guys had a previous that's meeting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which I feel was fitting. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. I brought you a gift when you we did. first met. Yeah, you did. Candle. And I was like, this is such a wonderful way to meet. <laughs> <laughs> it meant a lot to me. Yeah, you know, it's really funny. I think it was a, I think it was a rabbit. No, actually, it's antlers. It's antlers. Yeah. Which is funny because of fixation. Yeah. So our movie that um, premiered at TIFF this year um, has a lot of antlers in it. I think Leah just knew. <laughs> I nailed it. Yeah. Is yeah. that some sort of like twisted sim like symbolism? Um, like uh, most definitely. <laughs> okay. in, in a Mercedes Bryce Morgan film, it's all symbolism. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we roll. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's the status with fixation? Because you premiered at TIFF. Uh, it was last year, right? Yeah. That's huge. Congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. Well, where's it at now? Can people see it? What's the Yeah, what's so the um, ETA is repping the movie, um, and we'll have info soon on where people could see it. Um, <laughs> speaking of fixation and other films, question for the podcast. Mm -hmm. What makes an effective pitch? 
So there's multiple different ways to answer this because yeah. there's multiple different kinds of pitches. Mm -hmm. um, and so the main pitches that Katrina and I have experienced is we pitch things together as writers where we're pitching a concept off of um, something we've not yet written for development funds or it could be something we've written together. Or also I go on um, purely director pitches a lot for scripts that other people have written. Yeah, and then there's also pitches that are more uh, here. here's the all of the materials for investors or studios mm -hmm. or other partners um yeah I, I think that like overall and maybe you'll probably speak better to talking about director pitches uh but i think that overall it's really just a matter of making make it as simple as possible for someone else to pitch it for you so that's good i think at the end of the day and that i think that it comes from also as much as you can you want to try to meet the people that you're talking with and get information but you're not always going to have that luxury and you're not always going to know exactly how it's being spoken about so I think that really try to um, focus in on having the easiest pitch up front and then don't be afraid to be a little bit repetitive later on or space things out over pages so that people can really get it and there's a version of it like you know how in in children's movies there's the version of it that's for the kids and then the versions of it that's for the parents. Yes. Make both versions. Like the version that you can get really simply with only looking at it for a few seconds. And then make the version that someone who's pouring over their desk, really diligently reading all of it, can also understand and appreciate and feel like the nuance of it. Mm -hmm. And are you saying make those separate versions or weave them together? Weave them together yeah. if you can in, into the same document. I think that everyone's working so hard. Everyone's so busy. We all have a lot of pitches. And we've also seen most projects before. I, I get sent so many unsolicited submissions and solicited submissions or submissions from friends, submissions from collaborators, all, all of these different things. And it's you really want to be able to hit what is similar and so what people can grab onto, but also what is unique about it. Um, because we've all... You know, we've watched so many movies. Like, we we really get it. We understand the structure. We can read a sentence about something and probably try to guess the third act already. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like as much as you can lay it out for people, but also make it clear what the twist is. Um, that that's that's my simple advice. There's more specifics. Too. Sure. Yeah. So Mercedes, how does pitching as a writer differ than from pitching as a director? Other than like you may have someone else's script that you're bringing to people? What, what are the differences that you can like delineate for us? For sure. Um, so when I pitch as a writer, I'm fully bringing people through what the story is and selling the concept to them. Whereas when I get an ODA for pitching as a director, they already have the script, it already exists. So I'm not trying to convince them that the material is a good story. I'm trying to sell my take on it. And so those are just very different ways to approach it. And obviously for me to pitch my take on it, it's us seeing that the story in the same way, but I'm also going, okay, this is how I, my, my flavor take on it and how I'm going to add to it or what little tweaks I see. And for the people who don't know what ODA stands for, what is that specifically? Yeah. Open director, um, assignment, assignment. Yes. <laughs> gotcha. And those come from like your reps. They're like, Oh, this is for my a agents. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. I think a good follow up for that is how did you pitch? spoonful of sugar because I was lucky enough to not have to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so what was interesting about spoonful is there's there's some things like spoonful of sugar where it was uh, we had the script and Vanishing Angle, um, who we work with, uh, Matt Miller and Natalie Metzger said, hey, do you have any horror films, any horror scripts? And so I sent it to them. And all of a sudden, a month later, they said, Shutter read, read it and they loved it. And so I met with Shudder and it was really just sitting down. It wasn't really a pitch because I already read the script. It was just seeing if we aligned creatively. Um, and so it was more of a discussion than an actual formal pitch. Do you prefer that? Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's really nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's nice to just have a conversation instead of do a formal pitch because, of course, doing a formal pitch, like so many hundreds of hours go into it to... Yeah. to make it that way but it's different for every project also uh, another like piece of learning or what have you off of that i think that as much as you can make something not a pitch 
the more luck you have in making that project. And what I what I mean by that is just that there's so much formality in a pitch and, and there should be and it makes sense that there is. But if you can get it to the point where your materials are pitching it for you and then your conversation can be more about what excites you and the questions and the opportunities that come from that, I think that you're going to have more success in getting your movie actually made um, just because we're so, you know, like all of us, all of us went to, most of us went to school and have, you know, had the experience of having to listen to a lot of information come at us. And it's just, it, I think it's hard for, hard for people. And so I, I think that the more that you can break it down and make it easy for people to digest and then just have a conversation, the better that you'll, the better is, luck you'll have. And I think off of that too, what, what's been interesting as off of director pitches on other people's scripts is like having your material speak for you work in a different way. When I was pitching on things before I had features, it was me pitching, okay, this is how I see it. And it still is that, but people are able to reference my work. And so it's less me coming in with a blank slate. It's people going, oh, okay, we know how she would do this because we know her style. And so it's still speaking to that with that, but I'm able to have that speak for me more. And that it helps a lot. <laughs> that is wonderful because you do have a very distinct style. Like if, you, if I lined up three movies and they said, pick Mercedes movie, I would be able to. It's very, <laughs> um, it's a very distinct. And so that makes a lot of sense to me. So it's it's beneficial to have projects out there that people can look at. But if people don't have films, samples out there of their work, when you say materials, what type of materials for people who are like early on, like they've written a script, they're like, I got a good script. It's like how many more steps and how many more items do they need before like they could impress you enough to say, hey, okay, come, let's have, let's, let's talk, let's talk about your story and your stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to speak to fixation and spoonful of sugar, what we did with those is we had a full deck. So we had a, a visual deck that had images that invoked it. But we also had a mood reel. Um, and so that was something that's really, really helpful is people are able to get our tone because there's so many different ways you can interpret words or even if someone, you know, doesn't have time to read the script, they go, hey, watch this two minute mood reel and you'll get it and that's something i didn't know how valuable it was but that really really did help us a lot totally at what point did you come to realize that that sort of stuff is invaluable I right think after when, fixation yeah when it worked for us <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when it worked for us and we got funding we're like okay great doing that for every project yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so they didn't so this isn't something that you necessarily picked up at usc because i'm always curious about what do like people who yeah. did film programs get from that because I didn't. So this is something yeah. you picked up and you're like, oh, after school we learned that a mood reel is super yeah. important. I don't think we learned that at USC. We didn't. <laughs> yeah, we did We did go over pitching and one of, I think that was one of the, the most useful classes. things, the best classes at USC. Yeah. Um, we took a class and they, talk, they had us pitch with the class, which was great, but mood reels wasn't a thing that I think was ever talked about. Mm -mm. Wow. You know, we heard your pitch for Escape ESC in our first episode. Which is really great. A lot of fun. Which is really <laughs> yeah. great. And yeah. you do something that all the other pitches don't do. And it's unique is you give so much backstory to the story that your actual pitch is this, it's this short section of it. Can you speak a little bit about why you tweaked it that way? Yeah, I, I think, think, go for it. Oh, well, I, think, I think part of it is because it's based around uh, a true story or a true woman. So that, that might be part of the reason that we did it that way. I think also because people want to be, it, it take, it's, it's hard to ground yourself in a narrative. There's a reason that there's the first 10 minutes of every movie is actually just setting up the life of the character. But it's, I think it's a little bit easier and more palatable to understand uh you know, the thematics of something or how the questions that you're being asked, um, which I think is what we what we did, if I remember correctly, that was a mm -hmm. little bit ago, um, what we talked about. Do, do you have something to add? Yeah, no, definitely not. I think it's just leading people in with the hook. So mm -hmm. we've realized like, okay, as we talk to people, these are the things that their eyes light up over. Mm -hmm. And so people have very short attention spans. And so we started realizing like, okay, this is what pe is getting people invested because it's something that they can relate to. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to start with that. Yeah, and I think that every story has that that hook, right? It's normally, a, a lot of the 
a lot of the times it's normally the first thing that people say when they get really excited and like it's like if someone's rushing out of the elevator and you have to tell them fast right yeah it's the most cliche thing i could have said but you know what i mean Yeah, there's like no elevators in la exactly there's no no as <laughs> someone's i don't know someone's rushing up the street in Los Feliz and you need to tell them really quickly <laughs> <laughs> what the pitch of your movie is. Katrina has done this. Uh, no, I, I just, yeah, this is where I was today. But um, but you need to tell them really, really quickly. It's it's like, what's the thing that you, that you scream? Like, what if it was like this? Because mm-hmm. I think that a lot of the times questions get people more engaged too, which is also what we, mm-hmm. what we learned. Yeah. So if you two are working on a project together, you have the benefit of there's two of you. So you can mm-hmm. kind of workshop, rehearse out loud your pitches, et cetera. What if you don't have a partner? What do you what would you suggest to somebody? What would you do personally to rehearse, to iterate, to get your pitch so you're clear that when you're saying it aloud, it you know it pops, you know it's gonna like catch them. Yeah. I mean what I've done is um, when I'm doing director pitches on my own, I do practice saying it out loud. And I'll time myself, but then I always still say it out loud to people I trust, even if I'm not pitching with someone. And I've even said it out loud to different people in different areas. Like I have a friend and for her job, she pitches things in tech. And she taught me things that I didn't know that other film people did. She said, start your pitch with a question. Like ask people a personal question because everyone is very self-involved, not in a bad way, but they relate through things for themselves. So if you start that, all of a sudden they're listening to you because they're so they might tune out but if you say what would you do in this situation can you give a for instance in a pitch that you've done yeah um so for example i did this pitch and i started out with what was the saddest moment in your life (laughs) oh my god (laughs) did anyone answer you um it's like my question to katrina she's like this this question's so sad yeah they did because it was all about this community coming over together over a shared sadness and then the next question following that is what was the happiest and so my pitch was about how we could be happiest through bonding through our sad moments together um but all of a sudden it it makes people go oh okay we have to pay attention (laughs) this is intense (laughs) do you it's not rhetorical do you wait for an answer yeah, it, it depends on how many people I'm pitching to. So yeah. if I'm pitching to eight people, I don't. I kind of just let it sit for 20 seconds and everyone think about it. But if it's a smaller group, we we'll actually will talk about it. Wow. That's so that, that that leads me to wonder, you know, knowing your audience or reading the room is we, we've talked about that in a cursory way. If you're letting it sit for 20 seconds, how attuned are you to the people listening to your pitch in any given verbal pitch? regardless of what your plan is to like wait 20 seconds you know like how much are you like waiting for them to give you cues etc um very tuned i think something that we don't give enough importance to is uh letting things sit something that katrina and i have worked in with our pitches as i feel Mm -hmm. like sometimes we're so nervous about okay we have to do this fast as we'll just do it really fast but if you actually let people sit and think about things it's more powerful sometimes and so i think if it feels a little uncomfortable just let something hang in the air do it because it's more powerful. Mm -hmm. This is a phenomenon that I've come across with some industry people is you just talk and talk and talk fast to get, because time is money, right? I had a conversation with Vincent the other night and he he was listening and he just let me talk and I realized that I could slow down. Mm -hmm. That was so rare. It is. Yeah. Yeah. We're just going to let that hang there for 20 seconds. Exactly. <laughs> Good. I wanted it to. <laughs> so we're going to do something a little fun, um, unless you have any more questions. No, I'm, I'm ready to jump into the game that you've and come up with. This is great. There's nothing else that you want to say about pitching you think our audience would find beneficial? Um, I mean, I, I guess I could get really nitty gritty into the details of a pitch, but mm-hmm. that's something that would... That's a whole 30, 40 minute discussion. We can do a dedicated uh, (laughs) Then we'll invite you back. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When you're you're free, because obviously you got got things popping. That sounds great. (laughs) So we're going to play, not a game, it's the question game. Love the question game. We've all written four questions and we're going to go around the room and read our question and then answer the question. Nobody got a question that they wrote themselves. Let's start Some with... Some people got questions they didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with Mercedes. Okay. Um, the first one is, what are intros of new people and networking situations that have stuck in your head? 
I was at Sundance and I met this drag queen who came up to me and she handed me a condom with the name of their film on it and had that condom for a very long time. (laughs) (laughs) And I thought that was genius. And I remember her very well. Yeah. Did you watch the film? Um, or remember I the name? Didn't, which is really sad. But I remembered her. Okay. Do you yeah. remember the name of the film? Or I don't. I wish I could. I wish I could plug it right now. Okay. Damn. All right. Katrina. You need more than one condom. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> you need a box. <laughs> you need a whole box. I hate. Um, mine was, what's the worst script cut note you've gotten? <laughs> this is a great question. Who wrote this? I did. <laughs> <laughs> she has insider knowledge, though, to pose that question. Oh, with, yeah. With yeah, experience. I'm going to... Is this a shared note this that we've a, This is a shared note that me and Mercedes have gotten. I'm not going to give all of the details, but I'll give you enough to know. Great. Um, we were pitching... Um, we were pitching a project in which the... Feel free to add in more details, too, if you think mm. I'm missing anything. But basically one of the characters had to die there was there was a system in which the the main i'm being vague about this on purpose but basically there was a system in which the characters had to die kind of like a slasher um and one of the execs that we were pitching to a relatively high profile exec said that they didn't like the concept of the characters dying. Even though this was a horror pitch. This was they a, were listening for, specifically for oh, horror pitches. This is completely, what? it's it's not even supposed to be horror comedy. This was just pure horror is what they wanted. You're not pitching um, to Hallmark, in other words. No, this is not Hallmark. They've only done horror movies, really. And uh, and the, the note was, what if they turned into a chicken instead? <laughs> instead of dying, because dying was too too much. Yes. Death was too much. Yeah. Wait, did it make sense for the story yeah, for what's them the to turn into no. a chicken? Into was it about chicken. No, it was just something? it was just the suggestion of something not so intense. Yeah. That would be an alternative. The chicken had nothing to do with the narrative. There were no animals involved in this narrative. <laughs> it was a family um uh slasher film, yeah. essentially. Uh you know, those. Um So how did you handle that? I think we that said, we, interesting. We're we're gonna have to think about that. Yeah. You don't, but we didn't get the pitch, by the way. We did not win this project. It wasn't a good match. It was not a right <laughs> I, match. <laughs> I forget who it was, but maybe it was Steven Spielberg got a note that he didn't like on something, and he tried to think of a way, I don't know if it was him, tried to think of a way to like handle this note. And it was through email. So he emailed the person back, replied all to the whole production team, and said, ha, 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 that was really funny. <laughs> no. <laughs> Keep the jokes coming. <laughs> I've heard this story before. I have right? too. Who was it? Who was it? I thought, I think it was him. I don't know. Was it Steven Spielberg? It was, it was someone and whoever it was, bravo. Yeah. Kind of genius. <laughs> Probably far, far into his career where he can, he can do something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I have a question. In an alternative life, what's a non-industry career you'd have? Who did it? Who asked this? I did again. You have good questions. Thank you. Uh, well, I've done. I've done a lot of them. If teaching paid better, maybe teaching. Nice. You'd be a great teacher. I liked but it. But teaching what? If it if it paid more. Yeah, but yeah. like what subject? Oh, what subject? Writing. Yeah. Yeah, writing. I find it rewarding. Um, maybe this podcast is like a substitute for that. I think so. Yeah. You're all my children. <laughs> Fine by me. <laughs> Angel. <laughs> okay, it's my turn. Let's see. The question is, what do you think makes a good first act? That's a good one. Is this yours, Katrina? Yeah. Yeah. You guys alluded to it. It's simplicity in a pitch, right? So clarity about what the heck's going on. And I've talked this to death kind of on the podcast in the two episodes we've done. Um, is If I know what's going on and I can anticipate how big of a challenge it is going to be, then I think I'm, I'm set up, right? I'm like, I, I know who the character is. I know what the world is. I know where they're headed and what they want. Mm-hmm. And then I know how daunting it is. If those things are in place, then I'm, I'm, I'm on board. Is this true for reading a script and watching a movie? Or is it different if you are the author? Uh, what I want when I'm the audience is to not be seeing it, right? It's to 
to have things set up so well and with so much tension or passion or, or so much heart or whatnot that I'm not like, okay, this is clearly what they want and this is the obstacle in front of them. I don't want to, I don't want to see the forest. I want to be like in the trees, like running around as an audience member. And then as a, as a writer, I hopefully am trying to create that, but that's like the skeleton upon which it rests for me. You yeah. Know? Are they oriented? Are things set up? Is it going to be hard? If so, let's do it and then throw some twists in there, obviously, but that comes later. But that's a, that's a good first act for me. Yeah. Cool. What genre of film do you think is going to be back in 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like answering, pretending to know the answers to questions that I, there's no way in hell I could know. So I'll just philosophize on this. Yes. <laughs> in substitution of an answer. I really find it fascinating of what time period we're in. We were in postmodernism and now we're in metamodernism mm-hmm. for the super geeks out there like me. And so I don't know what comes next after that. I wonder if we're gonna go right back to the beginning of what we were before, or what the take is gonna be. And so I, I can't claim to know that, but I'm very interested to see what it will be. But something I can say that's really interesting right now is there are certain things that, for example, erotic thrillers are, are coming back into place. I got told a couple of years ago on my pitch decks to take out sexual imagery I had because it was too intense for people. But now apparently buyers are looking for that again. Wow. So I'm being told to add it back. Thank God. So there's, I know, so it's little shifts like that where I think it's funny because we haven't actually seen a ton of erotic thrillers come out yet because those are, that's what's happening right now mm-hmm. that people are putting funding and development into. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's something that's gonna be very soon. I would love to see a movie directed by you starring Glenn Close. <laughs> That would be amazing. Yeah. When you say you're being told to take images out and now put them back in, who is telling you or who's suggesting to you that this is what buyers are looking for? Uh, Producers and execs. Producers and execs. Yeah. Where do you think they get their intel from? From buyers. From buyers? And what do you think buyers are listening to? The market? Or they... Well, like what trends are what's what's guiding these trends is what I'm getting at. Yeah, I, th- I think it's I think it's people bringing back numbers of what they're able to actually bring back money in or not, and so it just kind of filters down the pipeline. What movie do you think it was that allowed that? Like the buyers are looking at, ooh, this movie sold. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, maybe it's the fact that horror films are doing so well, and they've seen that a lot of horror films have sex scenes more than other movies. True. recently and mm-hmm. so it's maybe it's people seeing that that is working and they didn't know that before and so i think we usually see trends of things through other things and so because horror movies are doing well right now they go ah here's a genre that people used to like we fell out of it mm-hmm. things go in cycles mm-hmm. like fashion goes in cycles of every 10 years and so i think we're back at that cycle good answer i have what elements need to be in a script for you to love it it's me that's you yeah It's subtly a difficult question because I think some of the power of great movies is that it's not necessarily that there's a specific subject that you love, but that there is a writer, director, creative team behind it Mm. that has such a love or perspective on it that maybe you wouldn't have initially found it interesting. Like I say, I say this all the time about, I don't know, like shows like Succession, where I think that if someone told me, like, it's going to be like some grumpy old rich dude and his <laughs> kids just constantly want his money, I'd be like, well, yeah, like I loved Arrested Development. I don't know what what's going to come from this. And then you see the show and it's so brilliantly mm-hmm. nuanced or even scripts. I'm, I'm blanking on them right now, but it's, you know, there's diff- so many different subcultures that you can go in. So I... I refuse to answer a specific topic, but um, I think in terms of uh, what tends to tends to draw me in is um, to to me it's anything that feels a little bit subversive of what what I've already seen. So someone experimenting, clearly showing that they understand structure, but being not afraid to experiment with something a little bit new. Uh, you know, I like, I like a little bit of humor thrown into everything. Yeah. I think that that's that's important. If I'm gonna cry with someone, I wanna, I need to be able to laugh first. And I think I think that that's definitely exciting. And you know, I feel like there's like topics that I do tend to gravitate towards more. But 
I don't know. Maybe I'm just a dork. I just love all movies. <laughs> it's a good answer. I think it's the hallmark of someone who's open to great stories and interesting characters, no matter where they come from, which is probably a testament to you as a, as a filmmaker. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. What execs in Hollywood do you feel should be applauded for truly supporting creative visions? This sounds like a Mercedes question. No, it's Katrina? Katrina. No. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I've heard Craig Mazin talk about Lindsay Duran, and I had the pleasure of seeing her speak at the Austin Film Festival back in 2018. I think how very detailed she is in the emotion of a story when she's giving notes to writers should be applauded. Is that kind of what you meant? Yeah, that's mean? exactly what I meant. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that you could answer it in any way. I just, I think that it's, you know, like some of the other questions are like, what are the worst notes you get? And I, there's, for for all of the, mm-hmm. the bad notes that we all feel and we all get, there's also people in every position that are real champions of art too. And so I, I want to, you know, for, for every, this note killed me and killed my vision. I think that there's also someone who's out there really, you know, working so hard behind the scenes, you know, having worked for like big companies like Disney before, I know it takes a lot of energy to push the needle, even the smallest amount. Yeah. And so the people that actually get to do that are the execs or the producers or other, other companies that, like you said, have such a, a handle on those um, those visions and on that nuance. I think that there's a, a special place in something for them. <laughs> I, I agree with you. And I also want to say, like, one of my personal champions has been Miranda Bailey from Cold Iron Pictures. Yeah. And she's, she's read my stuff and she loves my stuff. God bless her. And I once sent her a script and I said, this is a first draft. Please know that I know there are problems. And she goes, if you wrote it, I know it's good. And that just made me feel so good about my writing and myself because I associate my mood according to how well I write. Like my personhood is so very much attached to who I am as a writer. So it felt very validating. And I think that's a good way to start any note session is by saying, I love the heart that you have in this story. What if the emotion is? Maybe that doesn't apply it's a spoonful of sugar <laughs> no, i think that i i mean I, well uh, you guys let us know but i think that there's some heart to it too yeah good that makes me happy yeah. i can't wait to see it march 2nd march 2nd, march 2nd. <laughs> <laughs> all right i gotta move okay what was your first r-rated movie and the story that goes with it oh, that's, that's great. my question oh uh, was blood sport blood sport must have been r-rated is that Van Damme? Van Damme. What from, is Bloodsport? So this is great. So uh, an American um, set of brothers travel to somewhere in Asia to take part in a brutal and deadly underground, no rules karate fight tournament. You have to be able to do splits to be entered. So you have to be able to do the splits to win. And, and one of the brothers just goes to accompany his other brother who's like the top tier like American kickboxer fighter. And then that brother like, I think he like dies or he gets like beat up. And so then the brother just went to support has to like step in and avenge his death. And it's Jean-Claude Van Damme and it's a very much like 80s kung fu, like yeah, you know, they hold the pose and flex their muscles and they're all oiled up. I'm pretty sure my dad used to watch this once a week. (laughs) And so I would sneak, you know, from the hallway and watch and you know, he'd shoo me away. and then I watched it recently as an adult. I'm like, this is god awful. <laughs> yeah. This is this is as bad. <laughs> you know, all the martial arts friends I have, they're like, oh, you know, Bloodsport. Like, it's such an iconic film in those circles, but it is you, you can't. It's almost unwatchable. <laughs> it's 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 basically unwatchable, as great as it was. That's that's it. It's one of those drinking movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every time Van Damme is shirtless or does the splits. Yeah. Yeah. You're drunk in like 20 minutes. But it was popular, right? There's a uh, Bloodsport 2. Um isn't there? I'm there there probably was a Bloodsport 2. I don't know. It's I'm pretty sure I watched I watched it on VHS or Betamax. VHS. <laughs> All right, Mercedes. All right. This next question is what tr- um quote in quotes truth about the industry have you recently discovered and how are you coping? 
Um, That's a neat question, if you couldn't tell. Yes, I love it. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say recent, recent, but something I didn't know before I was too involved in the industry is what value was mm. in relation to actors. And uh, for those of you who don't know, it's basically actors have a certain amount of international or domestic value. And if an actor is very well known, it brings in a certain amount of guarantee of money. And so it's something where, especially with indie movies, you cast with in regards to value because that's what a lot of times gets financing interested. And so uh, for there are certain things where if you're casting a movie and you have all teenagers as the leads, it's almost impossible because there's barely any teenagers with value. And so it's something that we have to think of in regards to putting together projects that I never thought of when I first joined the industry. Is that helpful to know or is it a detriment? I think it's necessary um, to get things made just with how, where we are right now with indie filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you know who is the, 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 who factors value, who decides it, who is the committee that says these are the, this is the algorithm that goes into, you know, Joe Blow's value. Do you uh, know? It, it's, Number metrics numbers. I mean, do you want to answer this, Katrina? Yeah, it's more like it's it's more just talking about international sales. So it's it's any any company overseas that would be interested in them and taking the international rights to the movie. Um, and and it's it's more just. I mean, I think that it's just thinking of it as simply as if you're in if you're in your forties. And you're in a country, and you're making a movie in America, but you're you're making it to have someone who's not in America go see that movie, who's in their 40s, who would they recognize? Mm -hmm. And that's probably a good way to, without having to send any emails, understand who may or may not have value. Um, but just to add to your point, because I think it's a little bit of a depressing realization potentially, I think that you can... And what you were saying, Leah, of is that helpful to learn? I think yes, it's it's definitely helpful to learn and to know. But we can and we do this too. But it's you you can use things against each other. So kind of seesaw it. Like know know that that is the case, but don't not write roles for for teenagers. And it, it's um, just try to find other pieces that mark that value, and then use them to play against each other. So you can still tell the stories that you want, or it's the, it's the same reason as making our making sure that all of your your films are, you know, accurately showcasing like the world and are more diverse. It's not to say, like, go get someone with value that brings eyeballs to the the movie, but don't change, you know, don't necessarily change who your protagonist is. Um, Definitely, this is interesting because when angel and i did the sundance thing and i my mentor was simone ling she said when i asked her the question can i cast who i want to cast for this it's the all the things we could not carry mm -hmm. she goes absolutely because it's an independent film and whoever you cast in the male role the thomas role it's going to make their career and independent films are known for making actors careers so to be able to have that power and that choice in okay you know that you need to have somebody with value mm -hmm. but you also want to cast who you want to cast and maybe it's a quote unquote unknown i think that's like that's the ground of independent film right now right one thing and the other thing coming together mm -hmm. i mean well that's definitely how you uplift voices and bring new people you know it's it, like there's there's obviously such a want and desire to see more faces and if you look at a lot of shows or you know i maybe watch too many tnya shows um <laughs> no but if, thing. Uh, but take if, it back take it back no it's like here's the thing is like if you watch if you watch any of these shows i think it's worth being applauded because if you watch shows like heartbreak high or at, at shows that are that are like that that's the most recent one i watched um, a lot of the cast is people that have never been in anything and it's really really refreshing and it's because they had a platform to be able to do that isn't heartbreak high a remake of isn't there a previous heartbreak high there is. i don't think that applies then there is but like what about like generation that that was a totally new show yeah. that isn't based on something yeah. else it's, i think if there's things that are high enough concept 
then I think that's very different with like TV shows versus indie filmmaking. Yes, it is. It yeah. is definitely <laughs> different in TV shows versus indie filming. That's yeah. for sure. But yeah. I just I just mean that I think that those are bigger companies that are that are doing that and I think that that's I guess what I'm saying is that they're they're more in place to have the power to be able to do that and I think it's great when they do. Yeah. Which they could also do for films. Yeah. <laughs> How do you come up with ideas worthy of turning into a script? Uh, usually everything, everything is fodder for creative ideas. Any movie I watch or book I read or interaction that I have. And then I go, hey, Angel, I have uh, this idea. And then I go, no, no, that's not a script. <laughs> that's not true. He's like, yes, do that thing. Or I'll have an idea and then I'll come to the two of you at dinner and I'll be like, hey, I have this idea and I pitch it. And I wait to see the light in your eyes just go high, like the lumens are up there. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is the thing. And I think a follow-up question to this would be, how do I decide what to write next or what to focus my time on? I don't know. You just do. You just do. You do them all at the same time. But like that's Angel actually does. the question is, how do you decide what's going to be worthy of like turning into a script is different than, oh, this would be a good story. I'm going to sit down and like, fingers on keys for however many number oh. of weeks. You know, how do you then come to, I'm, I'm committing to this one. I'm, I meant, I have five ideas right now and I know the validity of all of them. What do I focus my time on? Like, how do I know which one's going to be picked up next? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I need to make rent. So usually yeah. that's a big factor. <laughs> <laughs> other, other than that, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do either of you have an answer for something like that? Mm. Yeah, because you have several. I mean, lots of projects going on. Yeah, I think that it's. Um, I feel like first of all, it's a, it's a, it's good to remind yourself that there is hopefully a lot of time in life, and that you're gonna <laughs> and that you're gonna keep rotating through the projects, and you know it takes a lot of time to get a, get anything made. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that for us, it tends to be something where if there's an outside factor that could help something move faster or we know, you know, something like, let's say something only takes, this will take three days and then we'll be able to get it off to cast or this will take three days, like this will take two weeks and then we'll be able to get it to this investor mm -hmm. or so-and-so. Um, that I think normally is what helps us decide because you could just sit there. If you, if you go and have to write a whole new script, it could take a, it could take a while. So I think it's, I think a lot of the times we pace our year based on when do we have the chunks Definitely. to do that versus when are we pushing out or doing yeah. rewrites on things. Definitely. Or like if, you know, you know that's like 100% true for scripts that are sent or if it's what to develop if I'm sent something that has financing attached versus not. Mm -hmm. it, it's sad to say, but I'll, I'll read that script first because yeah. that script's ready to go with a date. Yeah. And that's true for going out to cast or anybody yeah and the same thing too if it's like i'm approached as something just as just as a producer it's normally if something has other elements attached because that you know unfortunately just makes it feel people need to feel like something's real oh uh, yeah yeah and so you know if something has cast or something has dates or like you said like some there's like a hard out or there's some like there's something that makes it so it needs to be in a certain timeline that actually really helps to run with um and yeah, obviously, if the funding's there, then that just, you're well, already doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you, coming off of doing fixation or coming off of doing Spoonful of Sugar, where the buzz around those things are pertinent and about to happen. Are you lining up a project knowing that you want to spin something off of that heat? Yeah, I think definitely. I think uh, it's kind of what I was saying earlier, where it's people knowing your style more of going, oh, like we, I had a lot of people come out of those screenings and then I got sent a lot of projects through my agents of people going, oh, I feel like she'd be a good fit through this, which is cool because neither of them have been released yet. Um, <laughs> so that's such a great compliment. Yeah. Uh, but I think that just helps. And also just, I had so many meetings earlier in my career that go, that's great, but come go make a feature and come back and then talk to us then. Yeah. And so it's just having that. That opens up a door. The minute you can walk into a room and be like, I already directed a feature. Yeah. Definitely. I've had that. What's a theme or topic you want to explore that you think is ahead of its time? So this is really, 
so I wrote a script in 2021, um, and the it's a, it's a female myth psychological thriller um, with some science fiction in it, and the science in it is an actual science called optogenetics. Explained it to a friend of mine a year past as we sat down just a couple months ago, and she goes, I just learned all about this new science called optogenetics, and there's this guy <laughs> whose script I want to write. I'm like, oh yeah, like, kind of like the story I pitched you a year ago. She goes, oh my God, that's absolutely right. <laughs> So optogenetics is in one of my scripts and I hopefully am gonna explore that. Um, I'm also, I feel like this happens sometimes with me. Like, And I think John Zelzerny talked about it. He said he wrote a script on Alan Turing mm -hmm. and won the Sloan Scholarship in like 2002 and then like yeah. several, several, several years later, I forget the name of the writer, wrote you know the film that Benedict Cumberbatch starred in and won Academy Awards and he was just, it's, it's a topic that is a great playing ground for you know a story and it just is it's, it's too early it's too too soon so I think optogenetics is something that I'm that I'm interested in I also think also in red lighters the the dynamic is a young woman is seeking her mother's approval and what stands in her way is another young woman and not in a competitive way but in kind of a diabolically twisted way so having something that is female versus female without it being like sexual or competitive in the workplace in a, in a kind of a traditional way I think is a is a is a poor summary of a topic <laughs> that I think is maybe ahead of its time but I think there's some elements in that that are not quite ubiquitous in the market so it's a hard comp it's hard oh, it's it's like this but it's a little bit different in this way it's kind of its own thing which yeah can be you know a detriment to a story you're saying you know like people need to know like how does it like compare to things right yes but i so i'm producing this and i was applying to i think i was applying to a fellowship with it to go through mm -hmm. and they asked for comps and i said what's great about this script is the only other comp would be like this mesh of hidden figures and wakanda forever <laughs> Because, because other than that, BIPOC female scientist doesn't exist. Those are the only two that I can think of. Yeah. So in the way you frame it up, right, that doesn't compare. But it's it's almost almost like the fly, so like a Cronenberg. Yeah. But it's but it's not quite. But it's not tonally. Yeah, and maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's maybe that's my my uh, mistake as a as a writer. No, it means you're not, groundbreaking. I mean, I don't know. That, so that that'll be my answer. My own script, Red Lighters, hopefully. Hopefully, I get it made, and people realize that it's it's a it's a good story with some heart and you know some heartbreak in there. We'll get it made. Okay, so here's a question for both Katrina and oh. myself, and the question is, what did they teach you about writing in school? I feel like uh, USC the writing program was one of the best parts about the film school, and uh, it's taught us very very basic save the cat structure, and it was so damn useful. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I distinctly remember breaking down Toy Story and everyone was like, Toy Story is the most genius movie of all time. And <laughs> I still remember that class. Yeah. They said uh, it isn't the most genius? It no, it is. is. Yeah, I mean, it is. it's actually, if you if you watch it, it's so incredibly structurally sound. And I think that movie's less than 90 minutes, maybe. They, yeah. just, they just get it done. But was that John Lassen? Who did Toy Story? I, I wasn't taught that in class. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think that I agree. I think the USC was, was great at, in terms of that. And there was also just, there are great professors that really helped you explore. But this, this structure is really what I came away with. Yeah. Did they actually use Save the Cat as the reference? Or did was it you just, in mm -hmm. hindsight, realize that that was what they were most really akin did. to? They, they did? did. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I took a UCLA um, screenwriting course through their extension and it was just after Save the Cat came out and the screenwriter teacher was like, eh, you should really look at this book. He kind of mm -hmm. like nails some some tenets. So he was leaning that in the way. And this was in 2005, about. Mm -hmm. So I don't know when you were at USC, but this is a highly influential book across many collegiate campuses. And just real quick, it was John Lasseter. Lasseter. Lasseter was the place along I... Along with Pete Doctor um, and Andrew Stanton. Yeah, John Lasseter also did... Oh, what was that really good one with the in the brain, the kid's brain? Inside Out. Inside Out was so good. So good. So good. Their their process, just real quick, their process for breaking story, 
uh, Disney, Pixar, mm-hmm. from the little bit I've, I've seen, right? There's videos out there where they talk about this, is so rigorous and so deep mm-hmm. that it's no surprise to me that their stories, their movies are, like like you said, Toy Story is, you know, note perfect, basically. Mm-hmm. The the way they approach it and the, and the care they take with crafting their stories is really something to aspire to. And I think they have to get it right because animation is so you know labor intensive that they want to make sure that that element the story mm-hmm. is as sparkling as possible before they animate and have to redo all that stuff so just a little sidebar you were saying no i like it now i'll ice the quiz um <laughs> <laughs> my my next question is what's a dream project of yours you think will never see the light of day i know this is your question this is my question she's been ruining this question since she first opened it and and here here's the reason why is because I I refute this question. <laughs> I, let's, I, let's hear why. I I don't there's no way for me pr- to predict when projects are going to happen or which projects are going to happen in my lifetime, but I have enough faith in um I guess not to be cheesy, but storytelling and the creative people that I have around me that I'll constantly be feeling a dream project. Mm. Uh and I, I think that I also think that there's a time and place for everything. If you just look at different people's careers, uh, you know, there's always the dream that you you make a certain amount of movies and then someone lets you make an extra weird one. Um, and I, I think that that, you know, that makes it so that it's possible. And in terms of different topics, things that are subversive, you know, I think that we often say that things maybe are too too controversial but then you know go to go to alamo and see the movies that are going Mm -hmm. and being flocked to by crowds of people that absolutely adore these movies that you know didn't have a wide release and then came out and like were um years years later were completely put back together and gotten a release and so i don't know that i can ever say like with with confidence that every story that i want to be told is going to be told right now or told how i want want it to be per se or even maybe told with all of my control on it uh but i i do think that i do think that there's more of an audience than we traditionally allow ourselves to give credit to and i think that you know i think that people are more 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 intelligent and more begging of a diverse landscape of stories uh to be seen and you can see that at least in the the crannies of the people that flock to these very obscure movie, th- not that Alamo is obscure, but there's other obscure, more obscure movie theaters. Thank you, Alamo. I just really like you <laughs> um, that, that show those movies. And so I, um, I am going to say that no, no dream project of mine <laughs> is never going to see the light of day because I will find some way to make it. And at least one person is going to see it. Um, yeah. That well makes, answered. I, I appreciate snaps. your reputation. Thank you. <laughs> Th- that makes me so happy because I've read so many scripts that the two of you have personally written that in my mind, because it's a memory, it has images to it. So I think it's a film that I've seen. <laughs> I'm like, what was the name of that? Where can I watch that again? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't exist yet. Like the um, the the all female. Oh, all, all the men, men are dead. dead. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Or your uh, your TV show, <laughs> Relationship Anarchy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm like, where can I watch? Oh shit, it doesn't exist yet. <laughs> it'll happen. So it'll happen. Yeah. 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 That's already happening in your head, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Someone already saw it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So I guess that I, I can even rephrase my question. Leah, Leah already has seen every dream project of mine. <laughs> 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 okay. What's a movie that's changed your perspective on something? Is this you? Who is this? Oh, wait, this is me. This is you? <laughs> I it's similar handwriting. Oh, no, I'm um, sorry. A I'm movie thanks. that's changed your perspective on something. We're going to have to pause for a second because there are so many of them. Um, it's okay. That's why I traded it with you. <laughs> that's why I was like, I thought Katrina originally had this one. I did. <laughs> that's why it threw me you off. You guys are cheeky. My question. Uh, you know, I... I held off on watching This Is England with um, Joseph Gilgan, and I watched it in reverse. 
on accident like i watched the second season before i watched the first season so it changed how i i thought of of storytelling in the same way that um waking life richard linkletter Mm -hmm. how he plays around with time like my accidental watching of this show and then watching Richard Linkletter and his before trilogy and his boyhood show that he's done, he filmed it over 20 years, like that's changed my perspective on how can I tell a story? I don't know how I'm going to put that into something yet, but I want to. So it's changing, it's shifting your... How you can play around with time, yeah. actual physical time and storytelling. Yes. That's a great answer. Yeah. What makes you stay in an industry that rejects you nine times out of ten? That's a great question. That's mine. And I don't know that I have an answer. Mercedes. And that's our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it, it's, a, it's a good question. You just need one time out of ten. I... If you go out with 100 projects and then one time out of 10 happens and you're doing 10 projects. Mercedes says, have at least 100 scripts written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But to have, the, to have the stamina or the resiliency to, to not take those nine rejections as personal, mm-hmm. but like, oh, not this one, not this time, but maybe the next time, right? It's... it's it's how do you how do you, how do I shift my paradigm? And uh, honestly, I don't know that I I have adopted any sort of healthy way to be like, oh, this wasn't a no, this was just not today, sir. I think maybe just sheer like <laughs> toughness, like it's toughness because you once told me that hope doesn't factor into somebody saying yes. That is true, and I don't have a lot of hope for a lot of things. Yeah, not in this industry. But yeah. you, you know what? You know what? You know what keeps me going? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's what keeps me going. Um. I I think once I get involved in something and I start to understand it a little bit, I want to not master it like I want to be a master of this, but I want to get really fucking good. Like I want to understand the bones of these things mm-hmm. and see how good I can get. So Tom Cruise talks about you're not in competition with anybody but yourself, right? Like I wouldn't say I'm in competition with myself, but I'm like how good can I make a thing? For instance, what what have you applied that to most recently? My writing, my writing. Okay. So when I so I wrote Hammond, which I pitched in the first one, and it was a, it was an exercise for me. I didn't ever expect anyone to be interested in Hammond, and when people heard it and then read it, they're like, "Oh, this is actually pretty good." I was like, "Oh, okay." Well, I just wrote that as an exercise. So then the next script I sat down and I wrote, I was like, "Let me apply myself to learning some storytelling principles, ideas, and theories that I have not applied to my first script, which people liked, and see if I can come up with a better story." Mm-hmm. Let me let me expand my knowledge set and apply it to this thing and see how much better I can come up with something, right? And I think my next script, Red Lighters, is a better story. And I'm doing the same thing with the next two stories I'm writing. I'm like, I'm expanding my understanding and trying to reapply myself and see how good I can get at this thing. And then if along the way, these things sell or attract interest or, or get me other job offers, then great. But for me, the challenge is, is how do I find reward in learning and reapplying myself in these instances? So maybe it's not even factoring in the rejection so much as it is what is the process for me and how do I specifically find reward? Like the dopamine, you know, like energetic, psychological reward in this activity because the rejection exists, you know? Like you're gonna get rejected more than you're gonna get like hired. Mm -hmm. So then, how do I how do I thrive? And maybe that's why I shifted away from being talent quite so much because the rejection is so much higher. I can't imagine being an actor in this industry. Like being a writer and putting a year into something and submitting it to just a couple of people and then getting rejected once or twice from that as opposed to being an actor and going on auditions every day mm-hmm. and getting multiple rejections. Like they say don't take it personally, but that's you putting yourself out on the line and you're being rejected, rejected, rejected. And with, the ri- and with a written story, you can share that with friends. You can, I can give a script to you and be like, hey, do you like my script? And you're like, I really enjoyed it. I'm like, oh, my work, my effort mm-hmm. enriched this person's day. Mm-hmm. As an actor, you, are you gonna like monologue to your friend? Like maybe, but that's like, <laughs> it's such a less rewarding, like, uh, like, uh, 
like my script, my story lives on. My mm-hmm. physical performance as an actor, unless it's captured and edited with sound and color and all that stuff, does not live on. Mm-hmm. So. I personally love when people monologue to me, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Angel will call you up. He'll monologue I just, to I you. just did a little bit. <laughs> Keep it coming. <laughs> and that's all of the questions we have. No, we have questions. one more. Oh, we oh, have I one don't. more. One more for the surprise question. I don't question. know why I have an extra question. I don't know. Oh, okay. because she asked for both of you? Oh, yeah, because you said both of us should answer. I think so. Um, okay, so this one, this is a great question. Why do people like horror movies? That's my question. That's a really good question. And I've asked you this recently, that's, so I'm curious as well. That's why I asked it. Oh, Thank okay. You. I want to hear your answer too. I think, I mean, I think there's many reasons that people can like horror movies. Mm-hmm. I, I know that for me, I like horror movies because they tend to be the loudest, weirdest, most subversive takes on topics that are really uh really real and human and maybe aren't as spoken about or as comfortable to be spoken about but they're in the casing of something really really fun uh and so that's normally what what draws me to horror films but i I think that there's also anything that can create a subculture or uh, a community i think is really really powerful so if you think of you know, like there's certain franchises like there's Star Wars and Harry Potter and those create fans and um, like almost like a, a shared language. And I think that horror films do that for people that, that love horror too. Where they People that love horror know it so well that it feels like this secret language that they get to have. And it's, you know, it's, it's obviously a great way for us to um work through the (laughs) the fear that everyone has but also it's really funny right a lot of horror movies are really campy Mm -hmm. and i think that people people celebrate that and i i'm just really really happy that we're living in uh the last like decade i feel like we've really been putting horror back up on the shelf and putting it forward and giving it a little bit more money which is really really exciting and nice what was your answer? I Well, going back to what you said about it being this language and this subculture, I was on set last year doing, I think I was doing COVID work, and this grip was walking across the parking lot, and he had a Texas Chainsaw Massacre shirt on, and I yelled, hey, Toby Hooper, and he turned around, <laughs> and it felt so good. <laughs> I love that. I love yeah. that. That explains it in a nutshell, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> What's my reason? People like horror movies because, again, there's several reasons, right? They like to feel safe. Like, this thing is happening on the screen. This thing isn't happening to me. So I can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Um, I can be frightened in a safe kind of way. I think I like horror movies because, because of the female protagonists. And we don't see a lot of that. Or at least we didn't. Or at least I didn't growing up. I didn't see a lot of female protagonists. It was, you know, my dad controlled what movies were in the shop. And then what I got to see because of that, horror movies had all these great and powerful women. Um, I'm sure I have one more answer, but Angel's looking at me and I feel like he has something to say. No, I'm just listening. Oh. This is my I'm listening face. Well, you're fuzzy because I don't have my glasses on, uh, so it's, far it could be too. an anything face. Well, this is this is helpful for me to hear your answers for why people like horror, because I enjoy a good movie, and if it's a horror movie, then I enjoy it, but if it's just a horror film and it's not necessarily like story-rich, I sometimes have a hard time with it. Mm. But I understand that everyone has things that resonate with them more than others, and you know, saying it's... It's this casing that's kind of fun, but it's these real things that we're grappling with is a really helpful way for me to frame it up. So How I about appreciate it. Mercedes, why would Angel like Spoonful of Sugar? <laughs> oh no. Oh, I feel like I need to know Angel more to know what would resonate with you for Spoonful of Sugar. Well, I really enjoyed the movie Lolita. I thought that was a, a, a pretty tense and fascinating story. Yeah, As tragic Which as one? it was. Um, I saw the Jeremy <laughs> Irons one. I, okay. didn't, I didn't see the original. 
maybe no, 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 that one's great. Yeah, yeah, maybe you'll relate to something dark that these people do behind closed doors <laughs> that they would never actually tell people they're doing, and maybe that's why I wouldn't know why you would connect with it. Mm, I'm pretty open with how like weird I am, though. Yeah, but this is pretty weird. Okay, all right. <laughs> I can't wait to see it. I've seen, you know, I've seen the, the images from it, and mm. Leah's obviously talked a lot about it, and you know, um, she shared all the stuff that you, you know, shared with her about it. So I'm, I'm really stoked to see this, this trippy ride and that's our podcast Woo-hoo. oh thank you so much for coming yeah. in it's been real, thank thank you. We're driving you. and fighting la traffic oh, so late for sure for, for you, you always <laughs> Extra for Leah. are there any parting um thoughts bits of advice questions you have to share or you good is that it we just looked at each other <laughs> <laughs> love each other that's their message <laughs> when you're pitching pitch something you would want to have pitched to you mm-hmm. if you're telling something that you wouldn't find interesting or wouldn't want to watch then you shouldn't be pitching it because someone else won't either good advice that's good all right well thanks mm-hmm. again for coming all the way down katrina did you have something well i i i always have something Angel. yeah same. yeah sure um, <laughs> they don't get no, to hear I, what I, we don't share i think just because i was thinking about what you were talking about with the with the rejection and i i don't think that your idea is being rejected as ever ever personal i think that like what you can learn from is maybe the delivery or you can expand and grow as a storyteller in terms of how you deliver something but i i think that in terms of the actual story it just comes down to taste and timing and so it's like dating yeah exactly exactly like you're not gonna if you took i mean god there's so many you know what oh here's what here's what i'll deliver to Go and do yourself a favor because this is one of my favorite pastimes and go to IMDb and look up your favorite movies of all time and read the one star reviews and then, <laughs> and then think about rejection in Hollywood. Yes. <laughs> That's good. So we had the, we had the pleasure of uh, interviewing Susan Rogers, who was Prince's main sound engineer through the 80s, through some of his biggest hits. She went on to get her um, PhD in neuroscience mm. and shared that there's a part of the brain called the precuneus which they've studied that actually lights up and is activated when someone is an ex- so when someone is exposed to something that they like that resonates with them literally there's a part of the brain that says i like what you're experiencing i don't like what you're experiencing and she said there is no rhyme or reason that they've been able to discover about why something resonates with one person but it doesn't resonate with another person that's a mystery but they know that there's a brain region that controls someone saying I like that versus I don't like that. So what you're saying is backed up by science. Katrina? See? Amazing. There you go. It's science. (laughs) Science. (laughs) I won't drop your mic. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) Well, thank you both for coming. Appreciate it. I can't wait to hear nuts and bolts on pitching when you come back. For sure. Both of you. Yeah. And everybody check out Spoonful of Sugar Mm -hmm. written by Leah St. Marie. Directed by Mercedes, Mercedes Bryce, Bryce, Bryce Morgan. Morgan. And produced by Katrina Kudlick. Out then, on March 2nd, March 2nd on Shutter. And Fixation whenever it comes out. Yeah, yes. and Fixation. What do, <laughs> yeah. what do you think Soon. the timeline on Fixation is going to be? Stand by for more details this year. Yes. Okay. We're, we're in good hands with UTA. Not March 2nd. Not March 2nd. <laughs> okay, great. We got to space them out. <laughs> we'll, ha- we'll have you back on before that, uh, before that goes live so you can promote it a little bit and tell us more yeah. about it. Yeah, amazing. All right. Well, um, again, I am Angel and this is Pitch. And my partner in crime here is... Leah St. Marie. And for our guests we had... Mercedes Bryce Morgan. And Katrina Kudlick. Cheers from Hollywood. Cheers from Hollywood. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to the premium episode today, we had a few great writers. We had McKenna Tolman with her script, Escape the Tiger, Jason Reed with Loaded, Chelsea Isabella Clark James, and Robbie Rice Grees with their script, Anomalies. If you are on the fence about subscribing, know that a portion of all subscription fees go toward the nonprofit Young Storytellers, raising voices one story at a time.